Hello, hello. Good morning. Good morning, Prof. Good morning, good morning. How are you, sir? I'm all right, and you? I can't complain. Uh, I think maybe uh, in the uh, respect of time and respect of those who are on time, I feel that like maybe we should start, Prof. Are you comfortable with that, Prof? I'm I'm comfortable with it. No problem. Okay, cool. Uh, yeah. Let me just welcome ev everyone and thanks for taking time to join us uh, on this uh, workshop. Um, uh, the person who will be uh, conducting this world uh, workshop is Professor Willie. He will introduce himself in a, in a detail, but uh, the topic is going to be the decent work and funding issues within the cultural creative sector. Uh, what research? What is research telling us and implications for the uh, for the future of work? So uh, uh, before I hand over to Prof, uh, while we know that like this is online, I think like just to make it run smoother so so that then we don't uh, waste time. If maybe like we can just try and follow the etiquette of online, like if you've got a question to ask, maybe you can just raise your hand or like type and then we'll take notes and then give it uh, to Prof. Uh, but then Prof will advise if he wants to take or to be stopped while presenting or if he wants to answer the questions after his, his presentation. Uh, with that uh, said, uh, over to you, Prof. Thank you, thank you. Um, good morning, colleagues, and I hope we are all well and um, are ready for the year or already in the year uh, and it's all and its challenges that it poses. But also one of the fundamental and nice things about uh, the sector that you belong in is we are all one united family. We are constantly working right throughout the year in our different domains and uh, areas of influence. So I'm, I'm excited to be here um, because I am also um, a person who also works in the sector uh, as a creative myself. Uh, and I can only understand and empathize uh, with you concerning some of the things that we are going to talk about uh, today. I will be honest with you, I am an academic. So what I've tried to do with this presentation is to try and uh, try and make it sense also make sense so that practitioners can also understand some of the things that we are going to talk about. I have tried to also um, be very um, illustrative as well in uh, some of the points that we're going to cover uh, so that uh, it can also help in terms of uh, a, a reach in uh, what we are trying to 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 achieve um and like i said uh, i'm an academic i'm a creative um i write i also travel and i write about experiences uh, where i travel and uh, uh, share those experiences to the broader audience of people and I also, in my day job, am a researcher, and that allows me also to have one foot in the door. One of the things that I've been uh, constantly monitoring as part of the research we've been doing is the notion and the concept of decent work. Uh, some of you would know sustainable development goal number eight, uh, positions that there is, needs to be an emphasis on decent work uh, and economic growth. And I think um, often when we study the notion of decent work, it's mostly studied using the lens of the um, uh, formal uh, sector. And I use the word formal carefully, and I will illustrate why I've got a, a, a contestation against this formal word. And, and in fact, let me just dig into it. Uh, it's often used uh, as a way of um, trying to create the meaning that some jobs are formal and others are not. Um, as a person who did a bit of drama and um, uh, uh, theater work uh, during my uh, teenage days, one of the things that we were always told if you want to offend a creative is to ask them a question. So I know you said you, you're a musician. I know you said you are an artist, but how do you then, what, what's your full-time job? You know, as to imply that perhaps maybe uh, being a creative 
is not really a full-time job. There are also other perceptions we need to challenge, particularly in, as, uh, as perceptions which are framed in society. For instance, that uh, creatives by nature are just people who are just looking for an easy way out of the hardship of life. And so they run away with music, they run away with drama, with poetry, with uh, video games and gaming industry, so that they escape the world that we're living in. So what I'm going to show you and share with you is really to try and uh, bring together the varying viewpoints around decent work within the creative sector. And what I would like this to do is to ignite some form of sense of awareness of what creatives should be arguing for within the sector, not just their sector, but within the jobs and careers uh, context in which I research um, around. Ralph? Yes. Sorry to interrupt. Could you please turn on your camera? Oh, okay. Yes, thank you so much. I will turn it off at some point because I, I will need to just be walking around. So as part of just health reasons, but no uh, yeah, there we go. It should be on now. There we go. And so part and parcel of the work that we are arguing for in this uh, uh, is really to then say, how do we create um, an environment in which creatives themselves can have voices and, and uh, of influence towards not just their sector, but the wider uh, context in which they are working within. We um, were supervising an MBA student from Nelson Mandela University who was looking at museum attendance uh, as part of the, the, the post-COVID reality and what we can learn in terms of getting young people going into museums. And some of the work that comes out of that is really the necessity to also rejuvenate the sector in which creatives work in, so that it may also be attractive, so it may also uh, uh, offer some shine so that people can also be uh, part of uh, th th that particular context. So in the latter part of the uh, workshop, I will try to then share with you issues related to funding. I will show you from the screen how I go about looking for funding particularly as an academic with a creative uh, angle to the work that I do. And so as mentioned, uh, I'm, uh, I work as an academic, but I also learned a little uh, tool and trade, which I'm also harnessing upon as part of uh, uh, lessons from COVID, uh, which is making mocktails. And uh, it all started as just something during COVID, watching a few videos online, and then it's also now landed me into some great lucrative opportunities. I did my first function uh, in December for a uh, Mgidi here in East London. Um, Easter is coming up. So I'm I'm also enjoying the, the, the latitude of also trying to find new ways of reinventing myself as a person. And also, and that's what creatives do, re reinvent themselves constantly to the changing environment that they operate within. So let's get into the, the workshop. Um, there is a bit of debate, um, depending on which context you are coming from, about what exactly is a creative. And we know a creative to be a person, that's the easy part. Uh, but what sectors are classified as part of uh, the, the creative uh, sector as a, as a, as a context of uh, study and as a context of work? Uh, and I think the majority of us here would attest it's a context of work because you work in the sector. Uh, the UN presents some uh, enlightening views, which I think we must consider around uh, what the sector is about. And I think these views also assist us in also avoiding, uh, a, if you like, a narrowing of the sector but also it also allows us to be imaginative of how the sector is evolving and transforming. So for instance, you've got art classified there as a distinction between visual and performing arts. And I'm sure this was a 2008 uh, framing. It's getting broader and broader. You've got the media, which is quite popular, uh, art and audiovisual, public me published media and the new media. And I think new media is an area where we should also be tapping into 
uh, which is the idea of um, gaming, especially, uh, which uh, we are seeing a lot of uh, interest, particularly uh, gaming forums coming to this part of the hemisphere to try and encourage people to develop an appetite for gaming. I often just think of it as a struggle sometimes for that young person who likes to play roadblocks and who wants to create new uh, features for a new game that they use for them to tell their parent right now to say, mommy, daddy, I've decided what I want to do for life. I want to be a gamer. I want to, it, it, the, just the change and the thought process of the journey that that person will have to make is also interesting to consider. Then there's also a section, uh, sector classified as functional creativity. This is your design and creative services. A lot of our institutions, particularly your uh, former uh, uh, um, technicons and also universities of technology are emphasizing on this one. Uh, I know just down the road at, um, at Walter Sisulu University, they are very heavy on interior graphics design. And even some universities are also coming up with courses related to jewelry uh, and toys. I will tell you about the jewelry aspect because last year I spent uh, six months as a visiting professor at a university in the United Arab Emirates. And one of the things I noted that those guys are very big and heavy into their jewelry. Uh, and so there's also this uh, movement of things like gold coming into the from from Africa, coming into that market in the UAE and going beyond. And people who are really working and making quite a bit of money in uh, the, 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 the product that tries to see this gold making it to the, to the marketplace. Of course, there's another dilemma that uh, things like jewelry and uh, and so forth present, and it's a it's a it's, it was manifest and really magnified through a situation that happened in Botswana, where the Botswana were arguing uh, of the necessity for more fairness and equality around how uh, minerals mined in Botswana end up leaving Botswana as a country going overseas to be polished, in this case, diamonds. And then they try, they are brought back into the context. And then when they are brought back, there's another little problem. They come back expensive, ridiculously expensive, if you like, and makes them really be out of the reach of the ordinary Botswana. And so what a, a lot of um, uh, uh, companies then have argued and, you know, politicians even in Botswana have argued is there's necessity to keep the money in the value chain. Okay, let's polish these diamonds where they are mined and then let's use that as an opportunity if we're going to send them outside of Botswana they can easily go to, um, uh, to to that particular context to be to be to be to for the market, and we also have uh, quite an emerging one. Uh, I'm part of a conference that will be happening in PE at the latter in Kabecha at the latter part of the year around uh, issues of spirituality and ancestral imaginary imaginations. And I think we're starting to talk a lot here about cultural exhibitions. You are driving on your way to Mtata in the, in the Eastern Cape. You'll come across, um, uh, you know, work um, attributed to Nelson Mandela, you know, uh, the necessity even some are arguing <clears throat> of turning Kumbu into a, um, uh, a cultural hub so that the rest of the world can also be part of this. And uh, and, uh, and there's appetite. Uh, we, we've got colleagues from the United States who will be visiting us here in, at the Investor Fort Hare. And one of the things they would have, they've told us they want to do, they want us to take a drive to see where Nelson Mandela grew up and the village. And so that appetite for that type of um, uh, material heritage as part of the creative sector is being argued for as well. So this was a 2008 classification which we ordinarily use, uh, and I and I agree it is it's becoming broader and broader, uh, and, and you could have your own classification. But another one that I, I I also think we could have a look at is the one which comes out of the uh, paper on the economy of culture in Europe. Uh, a study really sanctioned through the um, European Commission, you'll actually notice that they, there's a distinction between the two. 
the, the, these ones, yes, they will touch on issues of heritage, but it is to what extent those issues of heritage are incorporated as part of that discussion. And that's crucial because um, the, the sector needs to develop. And in the, in the latter part of the presentation, I will show you a notable stride, which I commend uh, uh, the South African Cultural Observatory team in trying to do, is promoting a journal that is dedicated to providing evidence-based research and, 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 and information to try and help in terms of improving the sector. So you will you you will really appreciate that the development of the sector is dependent on all stakeholders working together to come up with creative solutions that benefit everybody. However, colleagues, this is also a sector which is noted with challenges, uh, and these are some of the challenges that uh, one can pick up uh, in a UNESCO report published in 2022, 95% of all cultural service originate from the global north. Now stop and think. 95% of all exports related to cultural service come from the global north. And so it creates really concerns around what do we in the global south potentially, uh, what are we doing in obviously tilting this disparity that is noted. Another concern during the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, there was a noted uh, decline uh, in terms of employment, particularly in the cultural and creative sectors. These were the hardest hit by the pandemic. And here are the numbers, over 10 million jobs in 2020 alone were lost. 10 million jobs in 2020 alone were lost. And it really raised another conversation, which I will raise as part of the uh, closing, which is this necessity to create some form of social protection measures to help and assist the creative sector. But I think job loss is a crucial, crucial aspect that was experienced as part of the pandemic, not just in South Africa, but a noted uh, global phenomenon. Adding further, today's International Women's uh, Day, 45% of women hold cultural occupations worldwide. Now, it says 45%. Uh, it could be more, uh, depending also on biases that exist in inherently the definition of some of these occupations, which could be sometimes uh, biased towards um, uh, also certain groups and certain professions being classified more to be. And this is where the classification is important to try and understand uh, really what are we talking about. But notably, 40, notably 45% of women hold cultural occupations worldwide. It could be and it should be higher. Within those 20% uh, of those employed in the cultural creative sector are noted to be young people. Again, caution, it could be that the, uh, there's a tilting balance towards certain uh, contexts. So if you go back to these two slides, and you look at how the creative sector is framed, you could find that perhaps maybe some young people are more prone to, to be attracted to certain creative sectors than others. So there's also necessity for research there to unpack really, and also not just unpacking where the areas of attraction are, but if in the case of uh, offering some form of a balance, how do we create this balance in view of uh, the, the sector we, we belong to? Um, in um, um, a, a note submitted by uh, the, uh, the director, um, she notes the following. Uh, when I took on the role of SACO executive director five years ago, I never imagined what would transpire in the intervening years. COVID-19, the meteoric rise of artificial intelligence, digitalization at scale, radical new trends, and many social, economic, and cultural shifts. I even called it, we spoke this morning, and I said, you're really being prophetic when you wrote this, because this is exactly part of the ideals of what uh, the future of work is about. The future of work, uh, and a, a misconception really sometimes, is framed to just be part of this idea 
of technology having a predominant influence of uh, the way tasks are done, etc. But it's really not so much about the role of technology, but it's about the role people using that technology can have to not only improve their lives, but the sectors in which they operate within. So what we are talking about really for the uh, future of work is to then say, how then do we use all these tools that we have to improve the sector that we operate in, but not only to improve the sector that we operate in, but to make sure um, how and when do we, do we position the role of um, social justice within these imperatives? How and when do we position the role of uh, culture, uh, heritage? How and when do we still preserve uh, what would be regarded as traditional artifacts that we have in society that we keep from one realm to the other? to make sure that it, it it really speaks to what that sector is about. So what we what we can then argue, colleagues, is we cannot run away from the future of work and its ideals. It is part of us. We must also find ways to um, coexist with this future of work idea ideals. In a very interesting set of uh, uh, publications and editorial written by Amankwa and Amo, um, uh, which is in the International Journal of Information Management, they note four things that we, we ought to be conscious of as creatives, especially concerning the future of work. The first of these, the creative industry must strike a balance between the human ingenuity and the collaborative effort that technology can have. In other words, we still need that creative spark, that creative uh, uh, brilliance that you have even in an ideal way, we are operating uh, with technology assisting in what we do. And I think this is crucial. This is crucial because often people who would frame the ideal of the future of work would rather take an extreme viewpoint of just be predicting it to be about um, uh, the technology. But it's really also about the human capital. How then do we fit the human control uh, the human aspect, the human ingenuity to be part of this ideal of the technology featuring as well. Then the second thing they argue is the notion of generative artificial intelligence as it accelerates creativity, streamlines workflows and sparks innovation. So basically what they are trying to say here is that even within the creative sector, we must have a conversation and a voice that allows us to fuse aspects related to artificial intelligence, related to technology usage in making this sector uh, work better. And also, I mean, uh, it, it's not all doom and gloom to just reduce the sector as not needing to be embracing some of these things. And this is the argument, then we cannot run away from the future of work. Number three, we need to maintain a human touch and authenticity, which presents a unique creative challenge. And I think this is where the promotion of decent work becomes crucial, because if you take it a step back, historically, there's always been a fear that comes with the fusion of technology within labor markets. Uh, labor markets. We fear for job losses, while at the same time, we may be full of praise to the uh, benefits that may be realized as part of the, the, the fusion of technology. But really, colleagues, we still need our creativity, our human touch within this uh, 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 context. And that in itself continues to create the challenges that we, we've got. And the challenge, one of which uh, uh, is the challenge of funding, for instance, creators across the world argue of an underdevelopment in their sector they argue of challenges related to not being taken seriously within the sectors that they operate within. And all of these continued challenges will be part of us. But 
we also need to also appreciate the potential ramifications that artificial intelligence ideals of the future of work can have in also helping that creative industry. And I think this is also an area I would appeal to our colleagues at SACO to investigate as part of research, how exactly can we uh, fuse AI in the sector in terms of making it better? Actually not looking outside the box. We do, uh, we're not just helping creatives get access to information, but how then do we create content that also would fit within this? So the ideal then becomes as, as, as I will argue in this uh, uh, presentation, the importance of fusing together uh, three facets, issues of decent work, issues of the cultural and the creative economy, but also fusing also the concept of the future of work. And decent work really has been defined in, in multiple contexts using multiple parameters, instruments, and tools. It's really defined as a sum of all of our aspirations in our working lives. I will show you a framing a little bit later on. It's what we are aspiring for in terms of opportunities and income. It's what we aspire for in terms of the exercise of writer's voice. It is what we aspire for to be recognized. And I think that is crucial. What creatives are crying out for globally is to be have to have that recognition for people to know who they are, what they do. It is what we are striving for in terms of stability. It is what we are striving for in terms of our own development and fairness and equality within the sector. I will show you a little bit later on how this um, situation of inequality exists and also potentially limits the um, experience of being a creative especially within uh, the cultural context that creatives operate within. So the International Labour Organization has therefore positioned then the importance of decent work to be crucial and a priority that needs to be, to be understood and experienced across different types of um, uh, professions. And I think the change is being noted here because historically the argument for decent work has mostly been uh, framed within white collar jobs, uh, has also been framed within industries, but but really even amongst creatives, we need to be also be emphasizing the issues of decent work. In work that we have been doing, um, we, we argue therefore the, the existence of complexity in framing and understanding decent work. And what is this complexity? This complexity comes at different levels and barriers. An individual complexity where the individual themselves as a creative would rather settle for less in what they do because of an, a, a lack of appreciation of the industry in which they work in. But this is also actuated by another level, which is a more sexual type of level, which is a more a, a level which tries to see other creatives as being superior to others, but also the, the whole notion of the creative sector not being taken seriously. So all these layers of co complexity then present to us opportunities, opportunities to have conversations like the ones that we're having this morning, which seek to also challenge really our understanding of what decent work is, but what does work, what does seeking a vocation mean uh, in terms of uh, what people are pursuing and you know the journey of uh, self-actualizations. So others note also that the challenge of job losses is, 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 is critical and cre creating a precarious situation in labor markets and also for the micro and macro environment. And so it's a high unemployment rate. Imagine the implications of the high unemployment rate to then starting to have a conversation as a, as a, as a child who as a teenager who's trying to negotiate to the parents that I want to be a creative and how that discussion is meted out and judged according to existing frameworks around what really is a normal job. And I think it's quite interesting when you look at it that way to say whatever it is that we call no normal is really also a societal creation. And only when the sector transforms itself in view of uh, its standards and norms, it really then creates a way of challenging 
some of these uh, norms that are, are created. And so my focus in, in framing decent work, I borrow from um, uh, the work of uh, a group of colleagues in, in America who are receiving quite international prominence as they talk about decent work as consisting of these five components. And we're going to look at each of these five components as we um, go on. And you can also reflect upon this as a creative to say, how well are you doing as part of these five components? The first of these are safe working conditions. In doing this research, um, I also note challenges that creatives face in terms of safe working conditions. I was in Uganda um, uh, a few uh, months ago and noted that um, some of the creatives there uh, were complaining around issues of um, uh, performing in places where their, their health is uh, put at risk in terms of uh, adequate safety and security. I know in some countries and some contexts, uh, when artists are about to perform, they need this assurance that uh, some safe working conditions exist. But these are not just safe working conditions related to professions where people are working with uh, the public, but even those people who are working as part of the, uh, the, the those jobs in the creative sector where they don't need to necessarily work in few view of the public. The issue of security, the issue of health and safety in what they are doing becomes very crucial and an issue that must be addressed. Number two, Duffy and colleagues also talk about decent work as, as part of the framing related to access to health care. And I think this is a big issue. I'll open it up after the slide, really. Uh, the, the, the idea that uh, creatives, some of them, do not have access to health care, particularly issues related to medical aid, is an issue of concern. One of the things that happens, uh, particularly within the sporting and the creative sector, at the sunset uh, of some of the people who have entertained us as we were, as we are growing up, as we were growing up you will notice they usually make a public appeal for help, for assistance, because they don't have the money to see them to retirement. So the access to healthcare actually becomes crucial because it is addressing an issue which is a fundamental and global right, really, to everybody, which is the, the, the issue of access to healthcare. It may be a fundamental and global issue that receives prominence, but the reality of it being uh, an issue which uh, people can say is, has been addressed uh, adequately uh, raises more questions. You will then hear a lot of talk around um, the in South Africa, our approach towards the NHI. You will also hear talk about, um, you know, uh, conscientizing uh, colleagues in sectors where there is no formal organization as per se, to also strive to be part of the idea of conserving and saving up in terms of uh, healthcare. Then the third issue that Daffy and colleague talk about is adequate compensation. How well do we pay creatives in the sector? Um, a going rate for creatives in the sector. Um, a, a good illustration of this is given by a, a friend of mine who says to me, uh, creatives for the longest part are abused by communities in the sense that um, you never go into pick and pay and you try to negotiate down the price of a cool drink. But if a creative were to come and say, I am willing to charge this amount of money, what happens? People will always try to say, okay, it must come down. It mustn't be this amount that they are asking for. This amount must come down. So adequate compensation becomes crucial. I spoke earlier on about the framing of the idea that I'm only doing this part time. I'm not serious about this. It's just a, the word they use now is it's just a side gig. Um, and I think that needs to change as well. We also talk about health and safety issues related to time and rest. Uh, particularly uh, creatives having a set time for work and a time which is stipulated on the side 
in terms of their own rest. I think it doesn't happen ordinarily because sometimes our thinking is that creatives can work around the clock as part of the work they do, but also the advocacy is starting to show that we need to start talking about encouraging people to uh, take seriously issues of uh, time and rest. And the final thing which Duffy and colleagues talk about is crucial for the creative sector is the issue of values. Now, the values can differ according to people and according to how they see the world and reality around them. But what is common in terms of our perception of values is really the idea that at least we should have standard set values of how creatives in the particular sector should behave according to whatever behaviors that they, they whatever situation that is presented to them. So the issue really is the issue of what values do we need to enforce and inculcate the sector to be at a stage where we think it, it, it should actually be. I want to open it up so that it's not only me talking. Um, any experience so far on this particular side to the issues of um, uh, these components, do you think that there are other things which are not on this framing of decent work that should be there. And again, I acknowledge that this is a framing done by American colleagues, which might not even uh, consider some issues related to our own uh, context as, um, as South Africa. Any reflections there on the issue of um, the work that creatives do, particularly in terms of decent work, at least what we've uh, uh, laid on the ground so far? We'll have to. Uh, Robin, you've got your hand up. Uh, go, go ahead, Robin. Okay, I think Robin, maybe you are muted. Yes, try to unmute. Oh, okay, let me try and see if we can do it uh, from this side. Colleagues uh, in the background, uh, would you try and help unmute Robin? All right, while we are doing that, hi, maybe... Hi, Prof. Uh, yes. Yes, Robin can speak. I've unmuted him. So okay. she can unmute on her side now, yeah. Okay, go ahead, Robin. Oh, I think we still have a problem there. Uh, okay, we'll come back to you, Robin. Uh, maybe uh, Lesiba? Or Lesiba is also muted. And they're saying they are still unable to unmute. Oh, thank Great, we can hear you now. Uh, uh, Lesiba, go ahead. I think they're still on YouTube. <coughs> uh, no, Lesiba? Yes, yes. Okay. Can I go ahead? Yes, yes please, you sir. may. Oh, no, thank, thank you very much uh, and uh, the, um, for you for opening this, this, this uh, opportunity, more especially on these points that you were talking to before we go too far. <laughs> on decent work. I think one of the things that one has, has experienced as, uh, as challenging, and I do not know if it's something that will address in your presentation as you go ahead, is how do you then frame decent work within in South Africa, within the Labor Relations Act uh, that offers those definitions and protection, social security, to those that are defined within the parameters of, of that legislation, and uh, but does not include uh, the creative sector uh, in that it, to, to the extent that it protects um, other sectors other than that you are a freelancer and so on and so. So how do you then start to bring in those protections when there is a legal framework and legislation that does not speak to that. 
and even create a framework where you can start to engage in that area. Uh, <clears throat> and even when it is extremely very difficult for, for, for trade unions that work within the sector uh, struggle for the longest of time to get recognition because they have to go through all these hoops and 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 struggles to get registered and recognized by by the system, uh, uh, so that it, it can enable them to talk to the issues that we are talking to. All of those that are important, all the five issues are important for you know five issues that you have raised. So so it's it's for me in South Africa we still struggling with the with the legislative framework to enable this discussion to to even you know be taken not that we should not we should continue to to advocate for it so i just thought i should i should bring that up and say in short the question is how do you proceed with this within these difficult uh, spaces where as you said you know we still taken as creatives and creative the creative industry is broad and no, normally when we talk creatives we'll focus on music and dance and, and theater and all where it's much broader than that so how do you then work with the with government and, and departments and ministers who don't even take you serious in as much as they may say you are contributing according to the master plan close to 200 billion or 160 billion to the economy and uh, they recognize that they appreciate that but they do not create environment that will make you uh, be super productive and, and and be protected i do not know if my comment my input is making any sense uh, but uh, that's what i thought i should i should make an input on on this point thank you very much no no, no thank you for that let's see and and i think you are touching an important issue uh, which we'll cover also in a document I want to share with the colleagues. Um, and I think the issue of advocacy and lobbying, uh, particularly for the rights of decent work, uh, of, of, of uh, creatives uh, in also being recognized as part of the LRA is, is a journey that we are reading about and which is really taking its center stage. And the more that the creative sector is becoming organized in terms of uh, a response to some of these challenges. I think let's go to Robin and then we'll come to Jonathan. Apologies, uh, I, I don't know people's uh, titles, so I will just call you by the first name basis. So uh, Robin, over to you. Are you still struggling, Robin? All right, uh, Jonathan. Robin? You, oh, yeah. Robin. Okay, let's go to Jonathan. Then. Okay. Um. Sana. Okay, I can read Robin's comments uh, while all, we're sorting it out. Uh, I'm a professional practice lecturer in two creative tertiary institutions. I've noticed creatives who come into the marketplace dismiss the professional ethics within the world of work, basic elements of how to approach a business, how to conduct a business activity, even as a freelancer that is separate to themselves. Also, there's a massive misunderstanding of how IP laws not only protect them, but also hold us res uh, responsible for our work. This impacts the amount of work that comes our way. Um, yeah, uh, and I think that summarizes the comment by Robin. Uh, glad you could uh, type that in the chat as well. Uh, Jonathan, then we move on. Uh, you can try Jonathan now. Okay. All right. Uh, okay. 
they'll try and help us colleagues and then we'll we'll see what we can do there uh let let's let's rather go on and then we we we, we take it from there um so i just thought i would also share with you um one of the most topical things that just happened uh, some of you would have seen this one is the uh, the story um uh cat williams being on uh club shay shay uh if you haven't watched it please watch it it's quite interesting and uh, lots of allegations and uh, things uh, that you wouldn't know uh, or some of you would know and have heard about. But what I thought this also uh, did for me is expose some of the things that could be happening in Hollywood as a context of work in terms of, if you think of it, the things that we spoke about, safe working conditions, access to healthcare, and really Cat Williams, I mean, makes uh, shares with us some of these challenges. I mean, the idea of decent work as consisting of working conditions, he brought about a story where he was threatened with a gun in retaliation. Uh, he says, they tried to kill me, not with jokes, with a real gun in my face on real camera. And the world was okay with it because it was me. I mean, the, the, the challenges that uh, um, creatives go through are, 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 are well documented. I got a funding from the National Heritage Council where we are writing a, a book, a comparative work between the works of Mutukudzi and Yuma Sakela. Um, one of uh, Oliver Mutukudzi's songs, uh, which he sang, uh, was banned across the you know the airwaves in, in Zimbabwe because of the allegation that it was um, not friendly to the social order. Because in the song, he was merely saying uh, to a imaginary leader, admit that you're old, admit that you're old and that you need to get out of power. And so um, it so happened at one of the concerts where this was happening, one of the, um, uh, the, the, the light guys then shone brightly the light, which was supposed to be shining on the stage to the, the picture of the president at that time. And yeah, it always created a sense of, uh, you know, people were scared because they thought, uh, if you are affiliated with this song, you are affiliated with the message that it comes with and uh, the message which is deemed to be anti-establishment. We do have cases of um, creatives um, uh, talking about victimization. Um, we spoke about unfair working conditions and so forth. It is a reality. And if it's happening even at a scale such as in Hollywood, it, it, it says a lot about the sector that uh, creators operate within. Access to health care after a series of missed gigs. This is taken from another article. An arrest on a gun charge and weeks of troubling rumors about behavior, be, behave, bizarre behavior. Um, they, they confirmed also that at some point, um, um, Cat Williams suffered from issues related to mental health. Now, in this case, which was quite interesting that he had access to the help that he needed. Creatives, some don't have this type of access, especially to the mental health challenge that affects the, the work that they do. Um, consisting of adequate compensation, in the particular interview on Club Shay Shay, he talks about uh, actually coming to the defense of Ice Cube. Uh, he had good things to say about Ice Cube, defending the artist from being bashed, from underpaying his actors and calling them ungrateful. So it's also on the other side of the coin. Um, can 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 it 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 looks at it not just from the part of uh, adequate compensation on the part of those who are performing the the work, but also on those who are perceived to be the one giving the work and the slander that often comes with that. So um, it, it, it was quite interesting when you also see it from that angle. And the emphasis on values, I think this was a constant one. Um, and I think I loved the idea of creatives standing up in terms of values around human dignity. And there's a whole debate there. I know some colleagues are already working on work around uh, the price people have to pay to get recognition. I mean, Cat Williams in this, uh, interview talks a lot about the wearing of dresses. Uh, we've also had a lot about uh, blackface. Uh, we've had a lot about people who use humor that uh, um, uh, dehumanizes in the name of art and so forth. But really, 
uh, this blew me away. Uh, the truth of the matter is the money mic in the original script gets raped in the bathroom, and that's what Ricky Smiley was okay with. Williams told Shannon, the problem with Friday After Next is we are trying to make a classic comedy, and this comedy involves a rape, and rape is never funny, no matter who it happens to or what the particular circumstances are. So just to, just to bring in a little bit of um, crea uh, creativity really to the presentation to say uh, the issues that creative, uh, uh, um uh, creatives, creatives face are really uh, universal. Uh, the challenges that they go through cross cut areas. And I think this interview alone, I mean, you can equally do the same with the follow up interview that he did with uh, um, uh, Terry Crews. OK, I think our voices are back. So let's quickly uh, give those voices back. Uh, Robin, uh, would you like to put a, a voice to the text that you sent us? Okay, not yet. Okay, what about uh, um, Jonathan? Oh, Jonathan, yes. Uh, Robin said, sadly, I'm unable to. And uh, Jonathan, any luck on your side? Okay. All right. Uh, still no luck on Jonathan's side. Okay. Let's let's move on, and then colleagues, you let me know when when we can uh, accommodate those voices. Uh, so Hi, Prof. Prof. Yes. Yes, uh, Jonathan. Jonathan. Yeah, on yeah, your your mic has been mic allowed. Been allowed. Just, just look next to the camera icon. icon. Then the mic icon will have a uh, thing, meaning it's uh, uh, active. Just click on your icon, then it will blue. Then you can speak. Me, I can see. Hi, Jonathan. Profi are muted as well. All right, I think let's let's let okay, let's I mean, oh. the, just to come in, chat. Yeah, I think maybe the guys in the back should should look at unmuting all of us. I think from the center where they are, from the control point, they've muted all of us. So it's it's difficult for us to unmute from no. our side. So you see, but oh. All your mics have been activated. All of you have your mics allowed. Okay. Awesome. Oh, okay. Yes. It's just that okay. you on your side, you just have to turn your mic on when yeah. you're speaking. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, let, let's let's move on, colleagues, and then we'll try in the, uh, at the next intermission to see if we can get uh, voices back. Uh, but thank you for the assistance. So. The next thing that I think is a crucial document that we all should read, and I take your point, um, Lesiba, when uh, when you came in earlier on, is the issue of uh, the legitimacy that we are striving for. And the legitimacy we're striving for is related to issues related to labor rights, fair labor rights across the board. And I think this is an important document, which I believe is, is, is becoming a feeder into various uh, legislation across the world, particularly labor legislation, in informing what is acceptable standards and what is not acceptable standards or what how the sector can improve. And maybe we could go through these points. Uh, I won't read all of them uh, verbatim, but just pinpoint the main salient issues and after the slide also hear what colleagues think. So this is a document available online from the International Labour Organization, which is really which is titled Promoting Decent Work in the African Cultural and Creative Economy. Now, this document for me is crucial because it points out some things that if there is somebody here 
who like Robin is teaching students like is a creative who's involved in advocacy and lobbying uh, a researcher a creative themselves who are who is about to sign a big uh, uh, contract to do some work I think to just conscientize yourself with some of the issues in this document becomes very important. It is a lengthy document. What I've tried to sum summate are 10 points that we could look at as creatives. The first one is there's an acknowledgement that work in the creative cultural sector cannot be said to be typical or standard in terms of employment relationships. Really, the lack of standards and norms is what is killing the sector. So we need to ask ourselves as creatives who are working in the sector, what are we doing in terms of creating these standards and these norms? Are you the type of creative when a gig comes your way, you do so much to um, get ahead of certain standards and norms, we should be universal to everybody else uh, um, in the name of wanting to get a, get the gig ahead. I mean, I'll give you an example where uh, certain creatives may say that I don't do certain things as part of the, the work that I do, um, or certain hours of work or certain conditions of work, whereas somebody would, might be willing to really circumvent those and to really go ahead and break each and one of those rules. So the idea for me really is uh, trying to create some form of um, structure to the sector. Uh, and I think this is where the role of uh, uh, civic bodies and uh, uh, organizations come in that fight for the rights of creatives. Um, a necessary intervention is therefore to develop mechanisms that ensures that those that are freelancers, micro enterprises, and informal workers have labor and social protection. I think this is a crucial, crucial point that is well argued for across the board within the creative sector, that there needs to be some form of protection, particularly labor and social protection. And I think if you see it in view of the first slide that we spoke about, which was talking about the issue of um, the challenge of creatives losing their jobs during COVID-19, and why we needed that uh, social protection to be in, in place. Uh, I think for future pandemic preparedness, we may need to be having important conversations that's, that say, how then do we bring legitimacy? How then do we bring dignity, human dignity for that matter, to creatives and the work that they do? We're starting to also see globally the emergence of advocacy and lobby groups that are speaking on behalf of workers, particularly workers uh, in, in terms of decent work in general, but also with, with cultural workers, freelancers, small and micro enterprises. Now, this becomes crucial because the work that the ILO then does is that they partner with those civic and uh, lobby uh, groups to be able to understand the sector of different countries, but also to be able to come up with interventions that are meant to assist creatives in those countries. And I think if you follow the ILO, you will see there's always an itinerary of events that are happening. Um, there's always research projects that are happening to try and document the experiences of uh, creatives themselves. And we'll share a lot about a bit about that in the funding section. Um, the other thing which we can talk about is the necessity to um, establish uh, programs that increase decent work for particularly marginalized groups. In this case, the talk is on the role that women and the youth can play. Uh, again, crucial because what we are observing is that uh, particularly those from the minority groups who are operating in this sector, the differentials exist in terms of uh, pay, in terms of even standards of treatment, according to the type of uh, uh, grouping that these people come from. And I think it's important that therefore labor rights also are given priority, not just for all creatives, but especially those creatives that uh, come from a context in which historically they would not have opportunity to uh, progress within the industry. Uh, due to issues such as gender and also the age of the, the creative. Now, the document therefore then talks about, uh, and I think Lesiba's point, 
the adoption of legislation by individual governments that extends to our social protection and also to the uh, sector as a whole. And I think this is something that if you read through our Department of Labor, they've been talking about through um, even Minister Tulas Nessi, uh, in talking to really the issues that are affected, uh, that are experienced by uh, uh, people in the creative sector, in also uh, coming with legislation that looks into the issues that assist the creatives themselves to advance in view of all these structural constraints that exist. And I think legislation is, is, is an important part of this discussion. Legislation even around, as was argued earlier on, how the LRA can be transformed also to um, accommodate even these uh, 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 forms of uh, industries that people are working with. But there's also a necessity to keep up with the advancement. And I, I, I quote the work of Professor Jen Snowball here um, and, and her colleagues arguing that the role that technology has played to the sector, this has affected uh, the emergence of business models, stakeholder relationships, uh, capability development around audiences, remuneration, and intellectual property uh, management. I think Robin raised that point on the call uh, on, in the chat um, around the role of IP, not just to work in favor of the creative, but potentially can also work against the creative. And so the crucial point, really, uh, as, as we have said earlier on, is we cannot run away to the, uh, the, the, the tide that is created through technological advancement. And as creatives, we need to find ways and to be able to to uh, uh, bring to, uh, to, 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 to light some of the issues that are covered there. Now, in, in, in presenting the last four points, I want to show with, with you what research is telling us in different countries and experiences that are happening. I'm going to start with Poland. Uh, this is an interesting study which was done in Poland um, and uh, the, quite fascinating because uh, of the uh, challenges of, and the nature, obviously, that that sector is facing. But this was one way that a local government can get involved in developing the creative sector. Uh, I will share with you an experience somebody shared with me here in the Eastern Cape, uh, where every year uh, one um, government entity uh, makes a call for funding for creatives uh, and, and very beautifully thought of uh, areas that they fund, drama, creative writing, you know, all those things that we spoke about at the start and how uh, every year when that advert always gets posted on social media, the complaints are always the same. Complaints around the transparency of the adjudication process. Who gets the funding of the, uh, uh, that is being advertised? And what, was some of the, what were some of the thought processes that were leading people into uh, being thought of as worthy beneficiaries of this funding, and also interference. You know, the 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 the, the competencies of those that are the adjudicators of this types of funding, and this Polish study, what it then tries to show, published in the Journal of Open Innovation, is really the role that local municipality development can play in also promoting the creative sector. The main findings really, um, in, in as much as there's a nationwide consensus to the importance of the creative sector, in Poland, this has also been decentralized a bit to try and have resonance, particularly at a local municipality level. And I think what we are trying to say here is instead of everybody looking to Pretoria, to the departments of arts, sports and culture for funding, um, the 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 Polish context is arguing and teaching us that the necessity to decentralize and let uh, municipalities have their own uh, interpretation of how they can develop the sector in view of the wider national efforts is also crucial. So special funds are being created in the city to support the creative creative sector. Now, they are not just relying on the, um, uh, the national government to assist here. They are also doing twin uh, city partnerships, uh, developing the tourism sector 
and as they develop the tourism sector, they are seeing what are called spillover, with the spillover growth, which is coming also into the uh, uh, creative sector. And so their plan really is a linear relationship where the city is then responsible in having a relationship with its own creatives. I mean, in the sports fraternity, the, the people will tell you for us here in the Eastern Cape, we lose a lot of our young uh, sportsmen, particularly rugby players to provinces in um, KwaZulu-Natal and in Gauteng. And as much as that is a good idea in terms of their own growth as individuals, it says a lot about the development of sport in the particular context that uh, these young people are coming from. So what the Polish are teaching us really here is the local municipality can have an influence in terms of how uh, uh, the development of the creative sector is to happen. I note also uh, to our colleagues in Kobecha, there is um, an advert that I just saw uh, through the Nelson Mandela uh, Bay municipality where they were calling for um, creatives to submit also uh, uh, proposals for funding. And I think that's crucial. Uh, however, it, it, the frustration will always be there because we have so many mouths chasing after one pot and one little pot for that matter. So what I think should be happening also on the ground in our various uh, provinces is a provincial outlook as to um, the development of the creative sector. And I think this is an important conversation. I know we've got uh, arts and culture uh, agencies that are located in our provinces. We've got CETAs that are also working in the particular sector. I think uh, it's it's not enough to just rely on just one pot, one pot uh, uh, in search for funding, especially funding for the particular sector. And if I was uh, teaching a class, really, I would then ask the question, what is the role of your local municipality in supporting the the creative sector. I don't know, maybe we can have a discussion around that. Any experiences to share from the context in which you are in of support that you as creatives are receiving in view of um, the work that you do? Particularly, I'm interested in experiences, positive and negative, from the municipality. Uh, Nati? Um, good morning, uh, everyone. Um... I'm not sure, can you hear me? Was yes, earlier you can hear you. Thank you. Um, um, thank you so much for, 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 for allowing me to engage on this conversation. Um, I just want to maybe just give a background of what I do and where I come from so that um, I'll be able to, then to outline the, the, the challenges that are faced within the creative sector. Um, I'm, 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 I work for an organization called Siavu Lateral Improvement Foundation. Uh, we, uh, we, are, we, are, we are doing skills development in uh, craft and visual arts. Uh, we are accredited with CATSITA on the uh, craft enterprise, and we've got uh, two skills program under that uh, craft enterprise program. Um, I, I, I am very much glad and happy that there's an engagement uh, that is uh, happening currently now with regards to decent work for, for the creatives. Um, I'm going to then be specific on, on, on visual arts and crafters. Um, one, we, the, 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 there's a serious challenge there, uh, such that well, what you've mentioned uh, earlier on is that many creatives, uh, they, they, they tend to um, or end up doing what they love as a part-time job or a side hustle because of the fact that it does not, the, the industry does not have sustainable job uh, a framework where we say that um, as a creative, you have a, a, you, you are a creative and you've got an eight to five job that you do. And then at the end of the month, there's a salary that you get or a stipend. So many creatives, they are not, uh, they, they, they don't uh, form part of, of people who are participating in the economy because of they are not bankable, they do not earn a, a, a monthly salary day to day, a monthly salary every month because of the fact that uh, producing artwork, it takes, it might take another, can produce artwork that might uh, uh, cost you maybe five days to finish. 
and then it will take you another three years for you to sell that artwork, which is which is another problem. Meaning that within the three years, there's nothing that um, one uh, as as a person will, will have an income and be able to to then work. And then hence, what you've raised also that um, there's a point that you raised that um, also people tend to then uh, tell the creatives that no no no. Your artwork uh, is very expensive. Uh, maybe scale it down a bit so that one can uh, can buy it. So they have those challenges. Um, so with that, what what we saw as an organization is that we have been able to then recruit many uh, creatives and then put them into the program, which is funded by Catseeker, uh, to to then give them a a a a a, a, a professional certificate of them being creatives and within the, the, the sector that they like. And then what then happens is that thereafter, they need to then go and hustle on their own, uh, meaning that even the organization is unable to then absorb them and, and, and provide jobs for for them so that they can uh, uh, be able to, to have their own uh, uh, income. So now, the, the, the challenge is that um, even the government itself um, be it the Department of uh, Arts and Culture, um, uh, the CITAS that you've mentioned, um, maybe I can just go as far as the, the social development. Um, I, I do not think that they have an appetite to, 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 to be able to come up with ways where they can be decent jobs for, for creatives, uh, which is, is, a, is a challenge. What we did as an organization, we tried to uh, come up with a concept that we, is called Artist in House, where we then um, have our artists in a maximum of 10 that will be able to then produce artwork and, and then we are able to then market that artwork. And then, but whilst we're marketing that artwork to be sold, there's funding um, that then pays those artist monthly, they say stipend, that will then pay them monthly so that they can then participate in the economic mainstream and then be happy that uh, at least there's, there's something happening in their lives and while they're producing, while there's uh, a process of uh, making sure that the artwork is being sold, it's there in the market, their names are there, they move from being, from being, from, from being emerging artists to uh, artists that are renowned and, and well-known. You know? So, so, so that is a challenge because we've been seeking funding so that we're able to then make sure that that concept lives. But um, yeah, for the past, um, uh, after after COVID, I think we started this concept, thinking about it after COVID, but, but uh, still now we haven't received any assistance with regards to 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 to, to that. So I, I, I guess we still have a long way to go as, as creatives or as people who are active in the industry to then be able to then come up with uh, innovative ways um, to, to, to get decent work for, 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 for creatives. Mm -hmm. uh, or the creative sector to have different, uh, uh, decent work uh, so that people can be able to then uh, be uh, uh, participate in the economy. Mm -hmm. The other challenge is that even Ketsita itself as a as a body that um, might then find ways to to have these innovative ideas where it, it it has a tourism sector in it and then we then found that um, having an art a subsector within Ketsita and then these creatives that they can be able to develop art but now tourism subsector does not assist them because I believe that they, we should then have a collaborative way where uh, 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 Ketsita can then assist that the creative, the, the art sector and the tourism sector can work together to be able to then assist these creatives to, to have a, a to have a, to, to, to get decent work and, 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 and live a life, a normal life like uh, any other a, a, a career that is there, you know. Hence, I think the, the point that we made is that it, it, it's a bit difficult for a child who um, learns 
liked or loved to have a career in this to tell their parents that hey, I want to be a crafter. Because one, they will tell them that oh, you're going to be poor, you're not going to make money. So therefore, at some point, the industry itself, it, it, it choose people that are active and it will die. That's, that's the view that I, I, I sometimes see and think of. Yeah. Um, in terms of funding, um, let, let, I, let's 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 uh, you've raised quite a lot, uh, um, uh, Nati, and you can come in on the second round of. Uh, I just I'm just curious. The hands are going up, so let's just hear what others have to say, and then when we've got time, we'll, we'll let you give the final shot at it. Uh, Lesiba, thank you. thank you, thank you for your comments, Nati. Really appreciate it. Uh, no, thank you, Prof. Um, just a quick one on, on the, the issue of local municipalities uh, contribution or role drawing from the, the Polish experience that you just shared with us. Um, where I come from, which is in the in Limpopo, the, the Waterbeck district, and I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if it happens in all, all districts across the country, but uh, I'm sure others would, would, would also comment on, comment on that is that you are you're talking about how critical or how important local municipalities roles are or will be uh, in the development and structuring and nature of talent at a, at a very lower entry level what we have in municipalities in in my area is that uh, the, con the, the 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 competency of arts culture uh, ends at district level. Mm -hmm. So in all four municipalities, uh, five actual municipalities, there is no delegated arts culture or official or maybe a, a, an officer who, who, who deals directly with talent or development of arts culture from 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 villages and townships around around that or suburbs around that. So, so that is the challenge that we have already, that uh, at local municipalities, there is nothing. So the competency of arts culture, arts and culture can be anywhere. You know, it can be it can be in the in the office of the mayor, which is allocated at a or, or, or to a role uh, of someone who speaks a spokesperson or it may be an advisor to the mayor or it can be in the manager's office municipality manager's office it can be anywhere uh, because, because I, think, I think and every time time every time we engage them uh, it is it is always like south africa has so many challenges uh, that art culture uh, and, and 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 heritage issues are not a priority because they always compare them to to other priorities of roads infrastructure and all that and their their response is always the same uh, that uh, there's so much that needs to be done that this this is not important it's not even part of their idp programs even if you fight and you do all make all sorts of noises it is not regarded as that so i think what you are bringing in now is important for, for, for us to, 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 to discuss and maybe also follow up with our advocacy, maybe structured engagement with government, so on, so, so that we can make sure that, that it goes to that level uh, where, where it, is taken, it is taken as seriously as it should. Uh, so, so, but it's not only that, uh, besides the, 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 the the legal infrastructure that we spoke to when it comes to labor and all. Just how this whole thing is structured uh, somehow creates creates problems. Mm. Uh, so I hope this discussion can be taken further beyond this to make sure that we engage on that level. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lesiba. Uh, um, Jonathan, um, I note you. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> all right, go ahead. Uh, our our hosts, uh, you, you want to come in? Uh, are we no, taking too long on the John question? <laughs> no, I was going to say Jonathan is next. Okay, okay. Okay, let's go to Jonathan. I, I, yeah, we'll come back to you, Robin. Uh, let's go to Jonathan. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Prof. I, I think you can hear me this time, eh? Yes, we can. 
All right, thank you so much. So um, I'm, I'm from Malawi. I'm, I'm, I'm actually participating from Malawi University of Science and Technology, but um, with a high interest in this particular field, because uh, it's, it's part of a silent narrative in our development field. Uh, but what I wanted to say previously, I wanted to say that I think uh, some of the elements that need to be recognized as, as uh, elements for decent work is freedom and equity. Because, I mean, you gave us examples of uh, some artists, musical artists, who, if they try and express themselves, they are uh, contradicting the, 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 the so called establishments. Uh, and yet, we're saying we, we are free humans, we can express ourselves, and there is no crime against humanity whatsoever. I, I think we need to recognize this. Now, coming back to your question here, what's the role of municipalities in the context of what we are talking about here? Look, my argument here is, um, unfortunately, and I'm reflecting this as an academic, that the framing of the definition of work rather than the nature of work is perhaps where we need to start from. What is work? We have made meant to believe that work is going into an office, a world rest, uh, in, in a very West-centric kind of uh, attire, and thus you're going to work. Uh, and yet, even when you dress in a very traditional attire, people will question your sanity, whether you, you are okay or not. Uh, and yet we are talking about here an industry, you know, a creative industry, fashion. Uh, I'm glad the, the African woman is now getting to understand the essence of our identity as Africans. I think we need to revisit, and I'm glad to say that the discourse about decolonizing our curriculum now is getting momentum, and we need to continue to question what is work, rather than what's the nature of work. But we need to redefine it, because whatever is being done within the creative industry has not received much attention because we have been cocooned and schooled to believe that this is not work, that is work. We need to do more because if that is not well emphasized, you will see that those people in offices called municipalities will not, will not take it seriously. Why? Because it departs from the so-called orthodoxy, the traditional way of uh, definition of work. I, I think for us as, an, as academics, let's come down to earth and realize it's time now to wake up and redefine what work is. Thank you so much, Prof. Otherwise, this is a great presentation. I'm glad I'm part of this conversation. Thank you. Thank you, thank Jonathan. You, thank you, Jonathan. I, I, I'm also happy to have you here because I also have Malawi origin. My grandmother was from Malawi, so I, I, it's good to also have the international audience. Uh, Atlas, is it Atlas? Yes, Prof. Can we have Atlas and then uh, Pamela, and then we can go to Robin after those two. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, greetings all, um, it's Atlas Duma here from um, Deben, South Africa. I represent an organization called Sakia Foundation. I am a founder and a, a director within the organization. Let me check if people can hear me. Prof, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, thank you so much. Um, well, uh, is the 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 conversation is very exciting so thanks for opening this up um it actually um touches in various issues that are very very imperative for the industry to discuss from time to time but recently we were disappointed by south africa when they vote against a fair deal versus uh, versus versus what what versus fair, fair deal and no versus fair use uh, the bill of rights um well i think the the, the 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 negotiation to revisit that is underway however i also want to touch uh, with regard to a question uh, of the 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 participation or contribution uh within the the municipalities I've done several works um, as a as a as a, a practitioner. I 
I, I founded KZN International Jazz Festival. Inaugural one was presented on the 3rd of June, 2023. We are heading to the second outfit um, this year, 2024. Um, I have experienced uh, the way the municipality uh, is, is actually uh, contributing towards the art. Uh, at Tewini, they have various divisions. So there's Department of uh, Deben Tourism. There is uh, the Department of Parks, Recreation and Culture. Um, they they fund the productions or the, the festivals or any art oriented business within the municipality. And um, there are some that comes in as mayoral uh, functions, but even if they could actually mm -hmm. act recognized as proposals from the communities, but if 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 the the mayor is interested, they ending up adopting such uh, presentations. Um, th there is a predicament within some other ways as to how they ended up funding you, which is very risky. And um, they, they they can actually leave you in trouble. Uh, we do left get left in troubles from time to time when we actually uh, uh, using the, the 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 way that I'm going to unfold right now. You know, um, funding art, they getting it associated with the political support or or, or they, they they put it along uh, politically inclined uh, uh, issues you know so your proposals can be loved and accepted by a certain official that is heading that department and they kept on saying um send several departments that actually supports uh, uh, your project but at the end of the day the, the, the processes can take you several days or weeks or even months. However, all those documents are being sent to the political structures that have to sign those documents, those, those, especially the, 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 the financial part of it uh, that, that need to be signed by those various departments and only to find that they can sign your documents while the artist is on the flight from whatever country you are bringing those artists to to, mm -hmm. to South Africa and they are on on the transit but the documents especially the documents for accommodation um, and and some other expenses that they agree that they are going to fund but the signatures are not there while the artist is on the way you know, so those are kind of risks that we encounter as as practitioners yeah. uh, when, when 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 the the, the your your project your projects are actually relying on 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 the local municipalities. I just wanted to to put that on the table and uh, bring about the awareness that whenever you you end up relying on on some of the departments within the municipalities, you have to encounter such risks. However, there are some other uh, arrangements that let you sign the documents uh, beforehand, but there are some of the arrangements that would, would that, that, that are so much risky, you know. So. Uh, well, I, I have indicated the various departments, I have indicated the risks, and we are not actually criticizing uh, the whole thing, but at the end of the day, it's just bringing about awareness that there are these some kind of things that are actually bothering us as creatives within the municipality. Let me just end the, the, the right now, because I, I guess there are some other people who are yeah. contributing the issue. Thank you, thank you, Atlas, for that. Uh, yeah, points all noted as well. Uh, political principles who even, I, I like your usage of the word, they sign while they're in transit. And uh, oh. yeah, it's just the nature of the reality as well we live in. Uh, Pemelo, and then lastly, Robin, then we move on. Pemelo?
temelo. Says you need you are not you need to unmute here and then I can go next while we're waiting if okay if that might help. Go ahead, I, Robin. Yeah. <laughs> finally I'm able to speak. Thank you so much for this um incredible conversation. And I think it's just the beginning of what we need to kind of tap into. So there are three different points that I want to do, and I'll try to do it as quickly as possible. First of all, thank you very much, colleagues, for bringing up all the relevant um, information and strife that we we find as creatives in this economy. One thing that we need to recognize is 3% of the country's GDP is linked to the creative industry. So although we are seen as individuals, as um, that the not important, we have a very important role within the creative economy of South Africa and necessarily the world. And we've seen that the creative economy um, has opened up a lot of doors that traditional business and traditional work has closed a lot of that. So most of the people that I work with and I've worked from various um, demographics are seeing that they're leaving traditional work, if I can say that, to go into the creative field because the 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 entry to to the creative fields are a lot less, and people are able to make money a lot quicker in the creative field. But in saying that, there are two major problems that we find within the creative sector. So the first problem is that when people come into the creative sector, they first of all ha have the wrong type of mindset around what is classified as decent work. How do you present yourself within decent work? As well as there's this ex expectation of handouts. So I am part of the fun economy and I'm part of the fun work. So therefore you need to kind of open up the treasure trove for us. And when government does do that, and when municipalities do do that, they put a lot of sludge on our way, being a um, lot of red tape, a lot of um, hoops that we need to do that most creatives go to the stance of, why should I actually go through the governmental uh, ways of funding and municipalities? And then that money becomes distrusted, like our colleague just said, whereby who is this money assigned to in terms of the political favor within our economy within our societies so there's a lot of mistrust around government and government funding although there's a lot of money available for the uprising of or the, or the betterment of the creative sector we see that creatives ha have turned now from what we considered as traditional work within the creative sector into entrepreneurship and they're taking ownership to a degree of, well, I need to put food on the table. Um, I'm not going to wait for government to or, or societal organizations to come to the party. I need to do what it needs to do for my family. So they really tapping into the uh, entrepreneurship within the creative economy. And I, I will not really ask this to you, sir, um, with this research. How can African creators embrace entrepreneurship while competing and leading in the world economy? Um, I would love your take. Um, I have a very strong positive take on that, but I would love to know your insights and the insights of our colleagues. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. And uh, oh, I'd say it last hand, but let's go to you, Cheryl. Then we 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 close this round, and then I'll, I will keep your question, Robin, about entrepreneurship. You will come a little bit later on when we go through the content. Uh, is it Cheryl Msomi? Yes, thank you, uh, Prof. Um, I just had to pick up my hand because uh, the previous speaker just really um, brought up things that I've been considering seriously for the past few days. So I'm the project manager of the a program that is called the Art Bank of South Africa, which is a government program um, funded by the government, uh, hosted by the National Museum, which is an agency of the Department of Sports, Arts and Culture. So over the years, we um, our mandate is actually to buy artworks and lease those artworks to the public and companies and other government departments. But what has happened is is because of the need in the sector, we've actually taken on projects um, given by the government to support artists, um, especially because of COVID. So the programs we do run um, include individual working with individual artists to create artworks, but also organizations 
so that we provide stipends for interns and they run internships in their organizations. Um, yes, we when we started working, major mistrust um, in government funding uh, because it it, it can be quite uh, difficult to get in and access those opportunities, which was why for us it was very important that even though they are um, compliance matters that have to, you know, we can't deviate from, we, we, we have tried to make it as clear um, to artists as possible. So now we, we have a situation where we've improved compliance rates for people who apply to us to 85%, which is pretty much unheard of because we do assist artists to um, to get to as far as possible to being compliant. It does require a lot of work, but if we put in the work, then more people are open to the opportunities. Um, so now the interesting um, situation we find ourselves in is because, because um, more people are benefiting from our programs, um, we're seeing a, um, uh, a, ten, a development of dependence on the programs that we do. So some of the programs were always supposed to be temporary, um, uh, but now we, we're finding in a situa ourselves in a situation where there's an expectation for these programs to continue. So each year we request more funding for it and... Um, but we're not sure for how long we will be able to receive that kind of um, support, which is why it becomes interesting for us to encourage the entrepreneurship um, mm -hmm. elements of, 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 for artists to understand that, yes, you, you do get support initially, but the support, ideally, it is to get you started. Um, so that you maybe three years down the line, you're not depending on the support anymore. So that's the kind of thinking we are going into now. Um, it's a question that we have um, to resolve and, 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 and figure out, which is why I'm in this session to get insights from you know, the people attending and yourself and the research and hopefully can help um, us look and strategize um, in a way that still supports the artists, but also um, finding ways for them to be uh, able to stand um, on their own at some point. Yeah, um, yeah. that's what yeah. I wanted to add. Thank you, thank you. We'll, we'll come to the answers a little bit later on on that particular angle of entrepreneurship. And Cheryl, I think I followed your work. Uh, you did an interview with Power FM one time around the work that you guys do. It's great to put a a link to the to the voice as well. I, I think I heard you on Power FM talking about the work that you do, which is quite fascinating as well. Uh, thank you for that session, colleagues. It's it's gone quite well in terms of getting feedback, and I and I and I think our colleagues uh, in um, in um, in in the in SACO and stakeholders here from government are listening to to the voices that have been shared here. So let's go to another one, which I thought was quite interesting. Is um, a partnership which is happening between the Chinese and the, the British. Uh, some would say, oh, wow, oil and water, how, how are they working together? Well, uh, this is particularly in the animation sector. And I think this is a sector which we are not talking a lot about, which we should be talking a lot about, which is looking at animation, the creative economy in terms of uh, the digital aspect. Now, what they did here, which is fascinating, was that they were trying to um, understand the role that uh, digitalization could play in developing the creative sector. Now, unfortunately, all our discussions have been rather rooted at maybe negotiating with political principles, um, you know, the, you know, the uh, navigation uh, around uh, this. Okay, the navigation around this. Um, but we also need to have a discussion also around how do we work well with the technology to be able to achieve some of these ideals. And I, and I think I'll come to their model that they've put right at the bottom there. So what they found in this particular work, they placed more emphasis on what they called collective learning, um, avoiding the silo mentality of working. Uh, so, for instance, it's about finding common people with, uh, you know, a common interest, 
but also people who are willing to feed and learn from each other in helping to make the sector better. It, particularly with the um, issue of the technology, there was necessity to enhance issues related to engagement and the creation of some form of a network of people and like-minded people who are you know, helping that particular sector. So the government role therefore was deemed crucial through subsidies, regulations, standardization. So we can also ask the same question um, in terms of our contribution of our government role. What are we doing to support even newer forms of uh, sectors within the creative sector themselves, animation, gaming, particularly in terms of helping those particular uh, efforts. I came and sat through a session with the Technology Innovation Agency, and they were looking for grassroots uh, uh, innovations to be able to fund, and they basically said we are willing to offer 200000 for somebody to come up with their innovation for its scaling to the market and so forth. But even within the current uh, uh, period and context of austerity, uh, that amount of money may not even be enough. I mean, for person who are involved in issues such as the animation industry, it, it, it really gets eaten up even by consultants who are trying to assist uh, that particular person. So there was necessity for this idea of collective learning, working together, and while also still allowing the government to have its influence in terms of the subsidies and regulations. But here was the other crucial thing. For the animation sector in the British and Chinese economies to succeed, the necessity existed for a system that encouraged innovation in its varying form. And this is where we cannot ignore the technology. We cannot ignore the technology because the technology can be useful in making us uh, our work be known out there quicker and also in its spread and its reach across. Uh, in its varying form, they then proposed three types of innovation, closed innovation, social innovation, and open innovation. I won't offer distinction there, but the model that you see there right at the bottom was what these guys then proposed as part of the, uh, the paper that they were working on. And um, really, it's really to say to us on the line, to say we need to find, we've called us as far as Malawi who are here, we need to find ways of then finding this idea of collective learning, not avoiding the silo mentality of working. And I, and I promise you, it's not only in the sector, but also as an academic, I will tell you, uh, people like to work alone. People like to go at it alone. All the glory to me alone. Yet what we sometimes have uh, are, are problems which could uh, be collectively solved through, uh, and I, they argue innovation, but really through some form of um, broader stakeholder engagement and working with everybody else in trying to achieve that. So that's an interesting observation. And then this is an, another interesting one uh, coming out of Japan. Um, and really they were trying to understand the growth of the Japanese creative industry sector. And they did something similar to the previous paper, which was this input uh, output, but really looking at it from the context uh, part of what is happening. The, what they observed here, patterns of output <clears throat> in the creative industry in Japan were not identical. They uh, really, there was import activity restricted and encouraged uh, the, the, them to then enforce it. And the sector changes also appeared to be determined by micro happenings, which is true. But what they did here, which is quite crucial, and maybe we can open it for discussion later on, they restricted also the, what can go out of the country and what all can also come into the country in terms of preserving the identity of the industry that they're operating in. I'll give you an example. A couple of years ago, um, um, the Zimbabwean government woke up to uh, a policy where they tried to have uh, local content only to be flighted or a, a certain percentage, I think 80% to 90% local content. Now, what, what strangely and oddly, um, for some, it created voices of dissent. Uh, but others would then say, well, it made us be aware of this new generation of artists known as urban groovers 
um, who are really coming up with a different vibe and a different flavor of music, who otherwise would not have had the opportunity if some of these restrictions had not put in place. Now, bear in mind, that's one way of looking at it. Here is another way of looking at it. This is in uh, Romania, I think, uh, Indonesia, sorry. This is in Indonesia. What they did now in Indonesia was to then take a different stance to Japan. They then said, uh-uh, let's allow for the free movement of art, free movement of skills, free movement of what is coming into the country, what we can get in, and what we can also send out in terms of our, our, our what we want. We want people to come to Indonesia. And here was the fascinating bit about the, 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 the results of this. They started knowing that, as the show was seeing that, as they were developing the creative sector, the, the, the tourism started also uh, growing exponentially. I think the point made by Robin True, 3% of our country's GDP is linked to the creative industry. And one of the things that is then crucial is then for us to actually see our work not just restricted to um, the tavern where we perform or the township where we are based or the municipality in which we operate within, but to see our work as having the potential to actually be a net bringer of uh, tourism or a net gain in terms of tourism for the particular country that uh, we are in or the country that you are in. And those were two fascinating contrasting examples between Japan and Indonesia with different effects. The first one was to preserve what is within the country. You may disagree, it may have worked, but the second one really was to really say, let's let things flow. Let's let whatever comes in. And we sometimes fear that because sometimes we fear the over domination of the other and uh, what it means for our industry. I mean, the, the textile industry is a good example. Everybody will tell you that most uh, fabric and textile is coming from China. So they are growing calls that we must protect our industry. I mean, it's on you know, chicken at some stage. There was, there was some talk about that. And I really found these two examples to be quite interesting, protecting what is within, but also making sure that we also have this other balance where we allow to remove restrictions. Um, last year, uh, as part of the uh, uh, six months that I was at uh, in, in the UAE, I went shopping one Sunday uh, morning and I happened to see fruit on the on the on the shelf of this uh, shop that I went uh, to shop in. And this fruit clearly was identified as fruit coming from South Africa. And in the moment of uh, excitement, I took a picture, I shared it with colleagues. We even wrote a nice little piece about it in one of the newspapers. But what did this mean for that local farmer? I would meet subsequently, uh, months after coming back, meet farmers who were part of that value chain, who were contributing to fruit which is leaving South Africa onto the shelves in the UAE. And that's crucial to strike a balance with, to say what we also need as creatives is to think of our work beyond our geographic borders, beyond even our continent, to save our work showcased uh, not only for as a benefit for yourself as a creative, but also for the country and as a net gainer in terms of uh, what we can uh, 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 get out of that. Here was another interesting one now, which is quite interesting then in terms of decent work issues. This was a study done in India. Uh, forgive me those who can pronounce this better. This was the traditional embroidery of uh, Chinkari, uh, the industry workers who work in Chinkari. And um, really what they sought to understand are how well-paid or not well-paid uh, creatives are in the particular uh, context in which they are operating within. So in this case, the industry, the creative industry was this new industry, which is the um, uh, Chinkari uh, industry. And, and the new year is used carefully because um, the sector is evolving. New and new forms of uh, expression in terms of art, heritage are coming up. So if for a country like India, they needed to create a new policy framework that was aiming to promote the sector, 
through modifying existing policies and making sure they bring a level of flexibility and inclusiveness to that particular sector. So there was noted observation in the particular traditional embroidery industry known as chinkari uh, of wage disparities according to way, age, education, work experience and religion. Now listen to this. The workers' age and education were significant at the lower quantile of being um, the, 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 the wage disparity, while work experience and religion were significantly at the 95th quantile. Additionally, male workers earned significantly more, earned significantly more than their female counterparts. Now, this is fascinating, for, at least for me, because what we also need to do in promoting decent work, we need to identify and challenge the man-made inherent systems in our creative sector that create continued disparities within the sector itself. And I think the issue of age, education, and in this case, religion, you know, where gender, we, we, we know of it historically in labor studies, but it's quite interesting to also see that even in the creative economy, even in the creative sector, we are also seeing challenges such as these uh, 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 wage disparities. Now, I want to open up for comments before we transition to what we can do in terms of promoting decent work and also address the issue of funding, particularly commentary around the issues of payments within the industry, this is the, in the, the lessons from the uh, India study. And all these material, by the way, colleagues, will be made available to you. I would also like to hear comments about what we can restrict in based on the Japan study, but also what we can allow as joint in and out free movement of, um, of, of, of creative talent. Bearing in mind also a crucial element is that what is stopping us from thinking beyond our local and uh, the places that we are based in to actually trying to showcase our work at a more larger scale. Uh, and then also the issue then of the, um, the role that digitalization can play to the creative industry and particularly the, the encouragement that what we need to be doing is encouraging a system of innovation, innovation that is also um, uh, cognizant of the necessity to work together but also cognizant of the necessity to uh, be part of a system, a system that works uh, in, 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 a, in a flow of innovation, allowing for not just how innovation is generated or comes about, but it's free transmission across the board. And then we can go to what can be done. So Pamela, you had your hand up the longest. I, I had to take some hands and I think you are now logged in on another device, so you'll be able to, to come in. Um, am I clear? Is this Pamela? Yes, we can hear you. We can hear you. Yeah. Um, Prof. Yes, Pamela, we can hear you. Okay. Go ahead. Um, thanks for that. My apologies. Um, some of us get uh, get to be faced with these challenges of technology. Uh, morning, colleagues. Um, I think what 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 I wanted to hop on is the the polish example I, I wanted to to add two or three issues on the issue the first one is that um, uh, when it comes to municipalities um there's a provision uh, in the republic of south africa's constitution uh, section 152 uh, subsection 1c it reads thus uh, the, ob the objects of local uh, local government are to promote social and economic development. So that section alone uh, is supposed to empower municipalities to deal with the issues of um, um, collaboration between the creative industry and the local municipality in that sense. So some of us, we, we, we were... Um, uh, we took initiatives and we proposed a memorandum of understanding, uh, which is currently gathering dust uh, at Salga. Um, the, the, the memorandum of understanding generally 
um, is, is empowered by the very same section of 152, where we are encouraging this collaboration. For starters, municipalities will tell you that their responsibility is service delivery, and then they they ignore this section, 152, subsection 1C, which must be uh, read in conjunction of 153A and B. Uh, those who've got time, please just go through that through that thing. But um, what I want to bring across is that uh, in the very same memorandum of understanding, we are of the view that uh, we cannot ignore um, the fact that uh, because mm-hmm. artists are struggling, therefore uh, municipalities must only focus on service delivery and not look at at our artists or the people who are practicing in the cultural and creative industries. Uh, and therefore, when they do their budgeting, they must make life easy. And this is also provided, of course, by the white, white paper on arts, culture, and heritage. If uh, you, 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 you make time and look at the white paper, there is one uh, uh, section, I just can't recall the section, that speak of having community art centers in wards. Uh, what we've picked up in some of our uh, uh, practices or in our way we're working, uh, we realize that when we have community art centers, you already are nurturing um, the discipline of arts, culture, and heritage at a very young age. And then people develop into artists that can compete in the cultural and creative industry. Now, um, we should then look at solutions. One of the solutions that we we... we we, we're looking at, or we should look at, is for instance, can we look at the comparison of the contribution of the GDP, rather the contribution of arts, culture, and heritage products to the gross domestic uh, product of a country? Uh, in the financial year of 2021, and no, 2020, 2021, if my memory serves me well, I think the GDP was 1.9%, which, which was around uh, 90, 90 billion rand. Um, and how, what, what contributed to that? Uh, it was sales, whether uh, movies, whether music, books, paintings, um, advertising. Advertising um, should be included in when we do sectoral division of um, the culture and creative industry. You you look at the contribution of those products to the GDP, and then you compare it with what the treasury is given to arts, culture, and heritage sector. And you'll realize that the money is very little. Uh, the percentage is very small when you compare it to the contribution of, of uh, the products to the GDP of the country. The second solution we can also look at, because people worry about funding, because we cannot ignore that. Then we can look at the tourism levy to check. Because tourists purchase arts, culture, and heritage products, therefore, uh, they may gain from the tourism levy for every one rent we we may propose to treasury uh, and say that uh, can we get 13 cents for every one rent for every uh, levy paid by tourists into oh. our country i mean we, we those are the two at, at this stage we can look at and then then it may mean every municipality can then make a submission to treasury to, to say uh, to contribute to this collaboration that we want to have as a municipality with the culture and creative industry. Can we source money for that? And then we can um, uh, fund some of these contributions. Uh, an example can just be a simple, somebody mentioned a festival now recently. Um, if we understand the concept of a festival, the festival is a feast. It means we are harvesting. We are harvesting what? The, the 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 seed that was planted and what are the seed that was planted we said all those who are contributing either in visual art and this is the seed that we are giving you some sort of seed funding to produce products that will be seen as arts culture and heritage uh, sales which contribute to the gdp of the country um, i'm hoping uh, i made sense in the little contribution i'm having and i didn't take anyone far back uh, thank you prof Thank you, thank you, Pamelo. I really loved that and those numbers that you were throwing around as well, uh, and, and a good uh, contribution indeed. So, colleagues, we, we want to move on to what can be done, and we can talk about funding a little bit. But any questions, comments, really about the 
what can we, I mean, recapping the role digitalization can play to the creative sector. We can't run away from it. It's a part of us. Uh, and then we spoke a bit about the experience of uh, preserving. What can we send out and not send out? Uh, and also allowing the free movement of creative content. How do we become bigger than our villages, our cities, our taverns, our townships, where we are operating within? And I think also the issue of funding also is crucial. But also I think the mindset of the creative must also be important to, 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 to that. And then also the issue in India around uh, challenges of disparities. And I think one of the things that we must do is address disparities that are not necessarily created by the labor market or the macroeconomic environment, but also disparities we create amongst ourselves as creatives. Okay, so uh, short and sharp, the contributions, and then uh, we, we quickly go. So let's go with uh, Avela, a new hand, welcome. Uh, thank you, sir. You speaking to Avela Kualela. I will just uh, introduce myself in this way. I am the chairperson of South African Arts and Culture Youth Forum in the Eastern Cape in South Africa. Um, my, as I'm listening, uh, I got in late. I need to apologize for that because I couldn't actually get to log in uh, up until I had to use my laptop. So um, as I'm listening to the discussions, né, um, for us, we are actually on the ground. Um, we are staying in Eastern Cape, one of the impoverished areas in the whole of South Africa, um, which has the capacity of um, more of an, an informal sector business in terms of the creative sector, whereby we have more of the numbers and craft work, visual art and uh, film, which is the sites that are actually used by filmmakers. So ours is actually something because I'm, I'm listening and, and, and the points that are being raised here in terms of support of governance as the organization in the Eastern Cape, we've actually gone to have um, our mandate is very clear because we're a youth um, uh, organization. So ours is to advocate for young people into the creative sector so for that they can be able to get into the uh, markets and be able to take their products to the higher level. So at this point of time, what we have actually identified on our side is that firstly, the challenge that we have is that Mostly of the, the in the understanding of the arts in in the whole of Eastern Cape is more of me creating the work, but the knowledge in terms of how to take the work to the markets and make sure that you are be able to earn and you can create a, a, a type of a business that is, it is actually going to the bigger markets, international, national. But those information is not actually something that is um, a common knowledge and common uh, understanding within the aspects of the area that we are in. So what we've actually understood is that if in order if you can change that, because most of the artists, I could just put into context in our research, is that most of the artists, when they are actually doing the work, most of them is just existing talent that is actually within them. So in in end, when someone just creates something for functional use, for make rooms, like in AI, and then in AI is actually a, um, a container that they use to pick up water. So they make it out of um, clay and then burn it on um, cow dao and then it becomes solid for that it can carry water and then they can be able to use water in the house so then that becomes the artifact that we are having but in an actual fact to make that container to be available for everyone because it has a cultural essence and also the story line now no one actually understands how to do that so what we understood is that at this point of time most of our artists are actually groomed that way they that is the only way that they understand how they actually develop into the arts because we don't have institutions that actually give um, information or can you train this um, artist? So everyone is actually uh, self-made, most of them, which is the majority of them. So what we created on is that as an organization, we, we started to actually took a, take a line of making sure that we are actually emphasizing on making sure that the skills are there and also the business skills and also the admission skills that are there. So we started with, um, for the film sector, we started with a program that is called um, From Script to Screen, which was last year. Um, we are funded. We were funded there with the, uh, with N with by NFEF for that project. We had 30 students that we trained for so that they can understand from starting a film to script up until it is on screen, and then actually gave them how the industry goes and how they are supposed to 
attaining that. And then we have them continuing because now we are actually having an MOU with Eastern Cape uh, Provincial Arts and Culture Council in which is going to be signed by next week so that we can have a, a clear um, uh, way of uh, working with government and making sure that those uh, students and other students are able to be actually in, included into the industry and then understand that. So secondly, now we have um, a program that is artists in schools that we are actually working with um, Charisma Music Foundation, um, National Youth Development Agency and uh, National Youth Service. So those uh, entities, we have um, 200 students in the Eastern Cape that are actually placed in schools now. But what we did on this one is that most of the artists we took um, uh, in terms of level of understanding for school, we took people who have at least grade 10 to grade 12, and then they must have a skill that they already have. But partly what we're doing there is to actually uh, groom these artists so that they can be able to take a space in terms of the educational aspects of um, education in terms of the creative sector. Because once we have actually looked at is that even if you talk about the development of the creative sector and the understanding from the villages to the townships and all of that, it's not there because if you look at the creative arts uh, learning area in the schools, it's actually something that is not taken into consideration on anyone because even the allocation of the teachers that have to teach the subject is according to whoever arrived last or who maybe knows a little bit of it, or someone who has a background of music, which is Cora. But when you look at the aspects of the, 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 the learning area itself, it has all the art forms that are actually there. So it makes it difficult to develop a young creative from uh, the, the, the lower levels of uh, foundation phase, uh, intermediate phase to senior phase. Then it becomes a problem if you are going to be saying we need educated artists that understand the administration and uh, the way of uh, getting to the markets. But at the end, we do not have um, some way of making sure that we develop that. So these students now are placed in those schools. They are having a year contract that we have with NYTA. And then at the end of this program, our aim is to actually make sure that APEC, since we are going to have an MOU signing next year, the next uh, week, we are aiming at influencing their bursary applications to include um, B8, which is a Bachelor of Education, and with the subjects of language and also a, 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 a cultural or an art subject, which is maybe visual art, drama, music, so that when they are taking into that, these kids can then go to school and study so that we can have uh, teachers that know the, the subjects that actually are trained artists and therefore they can be able to attain and, and groom other artists. So that, that is what we, we have done. But I will also start, uh, highlight the challenges that we are having. When it comes to the art sector in terms of government assistance, we do have assistance in terms of Department of Arts and Culture on certain avenues that they can be able to do and be able to ascend. But if you like take it to local government, um, wherever you talk about municipalities, that is where we lack because relation between Department of Arts and Culture and uh, the local municipalities, it, it's rather based on other things. But when it comes to the art sector, we've been trying to advocate here in the Krisani area and I'm showing our friends, so they've done the same in Nelson Mandela. So when you talk about Krista and you talk about the town, which is Queenstown, and if you talk about um, our friends, or you will talk about Bizana, Mount Fred, the area that Umamu Nomzamo Mandela came from, and Oartam. So you talk about Kabeha in NMB, and you talk about BCM in, uh, in BCM, you talk about East London. So those areas, there are relations that have been uh, forged, but you can actually see that there is no actually straightforward um, uh, type of relations that can be able to manifest in terms of grooming and making sure that the industry it actually has free access of information and free access to trade and free access to do um, according to the artists. The only uh, uh, um, region that uh, the only local municipality, the district municipality that already had an office that is a cultural office, it's um, OR Tambo that they have a direct fund for it. But because of certain things, that fund has actually dropped it from 500,000. I think that now it's about 150, if not 200,000, in which it was there to support the artist on things that they need to do. But I just wanted to give that uh, uh, um, just a background of what we are saying. Also, you are speaking about the art centers per watt. That one, in, at, at this moment in the Eastern Cape, we have about, because we have the research as the organization, because we're given that research by ECPEC to do last of last year. We have about 25 
according to the list in terms of the art centers, but the functional art centers that are there, there are about four that have programs and also have uh, things that they're actually doing. I can just name a few to say Combo Art Center in East London. Um, I can put um, the art center in Pizana. I can put the art center in Amtata. I can put the art center in Kaibeja, um, which is the Mendy art center. Um, in Queenstown, it is actually depleted now. It, it, it just a structure with no roofing with no pipes, with nothing. It's, it's, it's actually having no fence at, at this point of time. You go to Willow Vale, which is the Amatole region, you'll get to the art center there that people now are sleeping there. It's no longer an art center. It's a, it's more of a, a, a unpaid or, or, or free PNP. If you go to that art center, if you go to Etuwa, the two art centers are there. The other one is actually non-existent. It's just buildings that are actually now living goats and uh, and all of that and there's not even um fencing and you go to the second one that is also in that area I'll just, if i had that document i'll just mention the names the other one is actually some in the village it has the machinery it has the building the building is protected because it's under the um, the chief of the area so but it only is used when there are certain events that are coming with this wreck for whatever training that has to be done, but in terms of functional programs that they have into making sure that there is an industry that is thriving, it's not there. It's only based on event and event that will come when the budget is there for art centers. So in that aspect, I think if that could be a policy that could just drive government to be able to do the word toward uh, art centers, that could be very much great because the potential of artists in the Eastern Cape is there, but the platform for that growth and everything is something that is actually not there. But the art centers that I'm talking about now, those that are functional, they have structures, and there's also an organization that has been launched, I think, last or last year, if not last year, that is actually a reform of ICACA, which is now a, 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 an organization that sticks to art centers and the development of art center work. So in an actual fact, we're hoping that that organization will then come and be able to um, uh, push for infrastructure and therefore, um, and also put into terms of making sure that those art centers actually, those ones that are actually not working, will have a budget for them to work and also have the staffing that is going to be there. I'm also going to cite this thing because we've been talking about it as organizations that in these art centers that they are also not no work. I'm just going to be short, not to be long. In these art centers, there's an art center manager that is working at a district. Uh, at district. The art center managers are actually placed to be able to be able to run the art centers. But at the very same time, in terms of who actually makes sure that there are decisions that are made, we still have a problem because the director, the director manager will always say, I'm the one who has to approve everything that has come to the art center. And then the art center managers also come to say, I'm also the one. Then, then the art center, manager is also now under the offices of the directing manager. So whatever transpires there, it has to be approved by the by the by DISREC, not the art center itself and in also for it for it to have all its own um uh, ways of doing things, maybe they could have uh, um, a straightforward way of making sure that the art center manager is given power to actually work for the art centers and therefore report to. But the decision making now is always between the two people, so you don't even know what is going to happen, what is supposed to happen. So we do have those challenges that we have in the in, in, in the whole of Houston Cape. But uh, let me just end there before I, I um, end. Thank you very much. Um, Prof, you're sorry, your mic yeah. is muted. Uh, briefly, uh, JJ, uh, it's written JJ Foundation. Yes, yes. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm not gonna be long. Um, um, I'm from East London, uh, but I think I just want to highlight the issue, which I think is a serious problem that we're facing with when it comes to uh, local governments and these regional. Um, I don't know what you call them, um, offices, whatever. I think the problem that we are facing, and this is going to take forever to change, you have the people that are hired there, they are clueless of what they do. And this is one 
of the biggest issue, you know. Um, you, you cannot expect to make to have change when you're gonna put someone in the office who doesn't have experience, we are never involved in what they're doing, and you expect that that person can have an impact. You cannot have an impact when you don't know what you're doing. And um, I'm, I'm sure many of us maybe can, can, can relate to this, you know, but as practitioners, uh, I'm in a film and television space, you know, uh, we've tried so much to, 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 to get infrastructure in the province in Eastern Cape. And it's, it's, it's a mountain to write, you know, but we, we've ended up we're getting help now from outside the province because it's a nightmare to get assistance in the province. And now we're starting to win in terms of the infrastructure. I mean, for the past 12 months, we've managed to raise above 3 million for infrastructure. So we're starting to have a direction, but in the province, we're not able to get the assistance. So I think for me, if you think you can work with the local governments and whatsoever, Number one, it's people who are, who are there are not clueless. Number two, no matter how good is what you want to do, but there's a big red tape, you know, if you are not connected to someone who knows someone who knows someone, it's just a nightmare, you know? So I think for me, those two are some of the issues that I'm sure the colleagues can have already highlighted some, but for me, I think those are the, some of the main issues that makes arts not to be recognized because I think there's a colleague who just, was who just said something that what what the arts and culture and creative industry is 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 it's it's contributing the money that they give us back they fund us back is not equivalent to to what we contribute in the sector you know so for me i think uh it's it's the whole system is a mess i i maybe if we can try i don't know i don't know we or whoever is there on top they one day they can realize that if you want to bring change, why can't you appoint someone in the offices that, you know, that they've got experience of this so that they can be able to get practicality, you know, the practicality of things or how they should be done instead of just giving us someone who's clueless, who's some politician or whatsoever, who they know what they, they, they do, who they don't know what they do, you know. So for me, I, I, I think these are serious issues. And as long as we are experiencing these issues, uh, we're not, we are not going to grow. And it's going to be a very, very, very um, long way to go. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Lesiba, then we move on to closure now. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Um, I wanted to respond to the question that you were addressing of uh, access uh, to international or markets, whether we are opening or closing, and what the impact of that would be. And my comment is, is very brief in that I wanted to just bring to maybe our attention the, the signing of the, what do they call it? The Africa Free Continental Agreement is a big word. I don't know how to whether I'm do, using it correctly, but <laughs> Free Africa Continental Agreement, which seeks to open the market, the 1.2 billion market that we have as, as Africans and see how we can exploit uh, market that market um, for ourselves without even looking outside, responding to the to the to that thing, yeah, the AU AU uh, Agenda 2016. 2063 as uh, aspiration five that deals with arts and culture and, and, and heritage that is for us i'm sure there are other aspirations that speak to other sides of the of sectors of the economy now i'm saying i'm saying already in terms of africa the horse has already bolted because the the, the governments have signed that agreement maybe 50 or so countries or so uh, by last count i think They've already signed and opened the market uh, for, for trade. The question I think that we need to then look at through uh, uh, researchers and, and people like yourselves and, 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 and SACO and other institutions uh, and our, our colleagues in Malawi and other countries is, is, how, is how do we then respond as arts and culture sector to this thing, to this thing that is huge, that is, has just been signed and has opened the market 
Uh, and as South Africa, I don't know if we've already had that conversation, the circle guys would, would advise. I don't think we've had that conversation. And if we have not, that, like we are going to have the conversation around the impact of AI on the cultural creative industry next week. Uh, maybe we could also, in, uh, Prof, look at what what does this thing mean for the cultural and creative industries uh, for South Africa and maybe for the continent and how do we create those pathways uh, to to benefit from from, from it? Uh, so I think that is something that maybe I could I could bring on and we can discuss now or, or or discuss in future. But I also think on the question that the last speaker spoke to and we 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 spoke about this earlier of the local municipalities. One of the things that maybe we can we can we can note as as part of the research in future that will help us in restructuring this whole thing. Given uh, what that was saying with the with with the with, with the signing of agreements that are gathering dust, is also to then do an audit or a research into all the local municipalities, who is who in terms of arts and culture, mm -hmm. what 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 are the what are the skills that are there according to the previous speaker. Because if we don't do that audit, and, and I know SACO is supposed to be advising in terms of research to the department and government, uh, do that audit to say at this level, who is who? What are the policies? What is the infrastructure that, that can help us to go all the way down? And, and open, it, open up a discussion around that. Because if we don't do that, it will always remain as it is right now, where we all know that arts, culture, and heritage at that level is not taken serious by anyone. At that level, so maybe in future we can then uh, we can then uh, we can then have a much more progressive discussion around mm -hmm. around that area and 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 so on. So thank you, Prof. Thank you, thank you, colleagues. Uh, last ten minutes now. What can be done? Okay, so Lesiba and the other colleagues really unpack it um, very well. Uh, Robin, you also raised some important issues about entrepreneurship. We have now started at the University of Fortier. Uh, we are in the plans of uh, starting a new qualification, a Bachelor of Entrepreneurship. And what we are picking up is uh, it's becoming also popular because the other <clears throat> uh, faculties and departments around the universities are also saying, well, we also want our students to sit in their mo in, in this particular modules offered in this particular qualification. So I think from... Um, higher education landscape is we are trying to streamline to make sure that it becomes mandatory that every qualification that is offered at the institutional level at TVET or whatever, I'll talk about TVET now, it should have an, inter an, an integration of some form of entrepreneurship training. Uh, this also helps particularly in creatives having access to um, entrepreneurial thinking, entrepreneurial training to be able to say, okay, I am a creative, I know how to do my work, but I want to learn how to manage myself as an entity that is on the market that also is so that with some form of sustainability happening. Now, here's another way that creatives can also get some form of assistance. Right across the country, um, uh, CEDA has invested in um, uh, funding towards institutions of higher learning to be centers where they uh, allow community members to be able to access services to these uh, entrepreneurship hubs as part of the community engagement effort that that institution should be doing. So it's merely approaching some of those institutions to say, I'm a creative, I've been asked to write a business plan. I have no idea how to write a business plan. Can you please offer assistance with regard to this as part of the efforts that they are supposed to do? Now, please don't go there uh, with the plan due on Friday and you go there on Wednesday and you expect people to just drop everything to be able to assist you, but involve yourself in some form of negotiation around how this can be done. Um, I note with excitement the introduction of a new journal. I think SACO has been very, very um, instrumental in working on this, which is the uh, South African, the African Journal of Creative Economy, which where creatives, I hope, also will get a platform to be able to write about the work they do. But importantly, all these angles of research that we are talking about to try and understand 
the individualized issues around um, experiences of creatives, how creatives can the work of creatives links with local economic development, macroeconomic issues. This is going to be an important space through which this research can be accessed. Oh, of course, I also appeal to my academic colleagues in that uh, we need to make this research not only accessible, but also to speak to uh, uh, the ordinary people on the ground and not just be caught up in the uh, you know, academies language, if you like, in terms of how it is portrayed. Number two, I think there's necessity for the importance of social protection, uh, particularly in promoting decent work. This is taken from today's paper of uh, the Daily Dispatch. Uh, in fact, let me put it on this screen so that I don't have to look to the side. Uh, so basically what's happening here it's a very sad situation in the state of affairs concerning um, really uh, an issue which is around unpaid music royalties, particularly to a group uh, that is owned uh, or, or that is owed these royalties uh, by within an establishment. So I think stories like these, harrowing as they are, really point towards us having this uh, social protection order as part of the creative sector and we need it. Number two, I love what um, uh, Dr. Akona here talks about, the implementation of policy. We've got so much policy that is on the ground and also policy which is needing to be developed further um, and, and that really needs to be implemented. And I think I think uh, the, the advice she makes here, as such, the growth of the problems of the creative and cultural sector are rooted in our developmental agenda. We still have some policies in, the, in this agenda which have not been implemented. So the sector cannot solve its own problems in isolation from other public policies. And I think what we need is advocacy, lobbying around the importance of solving um, uh, such such uh, such policy issues. Number four, the continued affirmation of the cultural and creative sector and its linkage to development ideals. I mean, the three percent contribution to GDP, I, and I note some documents and figures have been thrown in the chat box as well. Crucial, crucial, crucial pieces of information we need to know. And I think what we also need to know is to realize that the work that we do as a collective as Part of this collective learning that we are arguing for is crucial also to changing not only the livelihoods of individuals but also the communities. Um, I think if you like as a, a good scenario to reflect upon is how creatives not only suffered during the COVID-19 pandemic period but also through embracing technology, digital concerts and or usage of technology. Creatives were some of the people who kept us going at a time of despondency and uncertainty uh, at the height of the, the pandemic. I think um, here is an interesting one. Uh, I think this was written by a um, Nigerian professor who was talking really here about the necess uh, borrowing for lessons from Nollywood uh, in Nigeria, what can be done, particularly in labor protection and social protection, uh, res dispute resolution. I think the case of the Daily Dispatch article that I shared with you really indicates that creatives know that it can't be that if they want to have their voices heard in terms of dispute, they run to the newspaper and they are splashed across the newspaper as this dispute that is happening. And the dispute takes center stage than the work of the creative. Now, how do you then encourage an appetite and an interest in the next generation to, to, to be involved in the creative sector as a whole? Uh, the, the, the necessity, I think we spoke about uh, protection of intellectual work, particularly looking through the hourglass of uh, what, what I think it was Robin who shared, um, what protects us can also work against us. And I loved that uh, illustration that we also need to educate creatives around not necessarily the standards around what they can do in terms of work, but also what they must also uphold in terms of what they are offering to their clientele and the customers. Um, yeah, and the, the rest you can read, the article is there. Um, but we also need to acknowledge, I think this is taken from Prof. Uh, Snowball, to acknowledge the creative sector as important. I think 3% 
contribution to GDP is important, uh, but actually it is an enduring uh, type of contribution. And Prof Snowball here says the cultural and creative sector has always had a vital but seldom acknowledged role to play towards issues of innovation, especially in times of change and upheaval. The next marvelous idea may just come from those working in the interface between the creative and technological sector. And, and I think this is where the future of work really fits in. The next creative idea, as Prof alludes here, lies also in probably people who are on this call this morning um, uh, talking about the creative sector. So let's briefly talk funding. Um, like I said, uh, this can be a workshop in itself on another day. Um, I just want to do two things in this particular part to just show you um, the search strategies for funding. Uh, there are different funders that are out there and I would also urge colleagues to think broadly outside of the usual uh, government funding to also think internationally. I'm a recipient of quite a number of uh, uh, funding from different uh, people, but um, notably within the creative economy, the National Heritage Council, also a bit of the, from the National Institute for the Humanities and Social Sciences. And um, in talking funding, when I talk to do workshops on this, I always try to present three models. In a funny way, these are three models of searching for funding. You can identify which one you identify with, but each of these has some consequences to it. So the first of those models, I call it the KFC model for searching for funding. A couple of years ago, we woke up to this amazing story, if you remember, of they called them the KFC couple. Now, I, I don't know, someone will correct me. I heard they are now divorced. I, I don't know how far true that is. But uh, the gentleman decided to uh, propose to their fiance at KFC, and somebody was filming, it went viral. And as it went viral, it was innovative, genuinely authentic. It happened to happen in a resource constrained context. It attracted attention and responses. People started, uh, they call it black Twitter. People started um, offering help one way or the other. We want to help with this, we want to help with that. But it was open to scrutiny and vulnerability. OK, some people laughed at this, at, at this guy to say, oh, dude, how do you do this at KFC? What am I driving through here? As creatives, as people who work in the sector, one of the things we must acknowledge is the challenges that we have towards access to funding. And I really think what we need to be doing in borrowing from this model of searching for funding is really to make ourselves open and available so that people can be aware of the different types of uh, contribution we can make through the uh, sector that we are uh, working within. Uh, it will attract attention, and obviously it will also attract uh, positive attention and responses. If it was a workshop, a day workshop, we would have shown you the type of examples of how you can make yourselves be available. I run a workshop on personal branding and personal marketing, how you can make yourself available to the public realm through a social media presence that makes people you know, see the kind of work that you want to do. And I think this is quite a unique, not unique in the sense that it's, it hasn't been done, but it's unique in the sense that it puts you out there to be able to receive the funding that you actually are looking for. It also puts you to scrutiny and vulnerability. Um, people would want accountability. I think there's nothing funders hate than uh, a failure to comply with their funding uh, uh, requirements in terms of reporting mechanisms uh, as part of the, the, the work that they are doing. Then the second one I always advocate for, I call it the Valentina Acker model of searching for research funding. This is an interesting one because it involves two people. This is noted to be the shortest marriage that ever happened in Hollywood of these two. And uh, really, um, the story is that screen legend Rudolf Valentino and actress Jean Acker uh, were married in 1919, but barely with the service before uh, over, the bride began to regret and started having second thoughts and decided to look uh, to lock her new husband out of their honeymoon suite. After knocking for 20 minutes, 
Valentino simply went home in divorce proceedings. Jean Acker claimed they never consummated their union, which is not surprising given that her famed husband uh, failed to get past the bedroom door. Now, funny as it may be, uh, what we're talking about here is people who give up in the funding model search. They get that rejection and they automatically think that there's no hope for us all in terms of what we can get as access in terms of for, for funding. Uh, sometimes we don't put conscious thought to what we are doing. Uh, I think there needs to be a commitment actually to finding ways of creating this um, idea of searching for funding. And there needs to be an understanding also of the other what are funders looking for? If it was a day workshop, what would have done here is to sit down and look at funders' expectations of uh, um, uh, a funding proposal and also how you then can align yourself. And I think it's crucial to read those instruction guidelines of how your project or how your proposal can align itself to what the funders are looking for. And then the final one really, which uh, I always say to my students and uh, you know mentors and uh, mentees that I work with to say, listen, the Robin Hood model of searching for research funding, Really, it's going out there uh, as uh, in the, um, the story of Robin Hood to look out for opportunities and look out for opportunities, particularly to people who are interested as part of corrective justice, as part of also giving back and correcting the wrongs of the past in getting funding out there to be known to people to access. So it's deliberate, continual. You do not give up. You keep going. You look for opportunities. And a greater good is done in terms of seeking um, uh, that particular uh, uh, funding. I want to also say then some questions we must pause as we search for funding. What do I want to do? How much is it going to cost? How long will it take? What is the benefit of what I'm doing and proposing to the funder and to myself? In what stage is it going to benefit me in my career? And I want to share with you as part of the, the last slide, I want to share with you a website I constantly uh, look out for opportunities for, um, um, which I think uh, I'm encouraging everybody to have a look at. And this will be the last point, colleagues. Um, and then we can uh, open it up for discussions. And the website is really called Opportunities for Africans. I'm going to share with you on the screen and you can just see the vastness of this particular site in terms of uh, assisting also uh, the work uh, of creatives. And what I like about this particular site, I'm gonna share it now on the screen. It really looks for funding also, not just for academic projects, but it also considers uh, projects related to the creative economy. And so I'm going to put it up uh, and then we open it up for questions. Uh, one second as I put up the, 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 the website system is slow on my side. Okay, let's try again, share. I really would love this to be up. So yeah, there we go. Uh, so that there's also a, a practical aspect to it that colleagues can also see. Uh, <clears throat> this is a website I have been using for the bigger part of five years now. Um, at one stage, I even started even sending a donation, I think 20 US dollars or so, to whoever runs this website. It's called Opportunities for Africans, uh, OFA. And basically, on a day-to-day -day basis, on this particular website, on their social media platforms, what they do is they um, put out calls for different categories of funding that can be accessed for academics uh, and for creatives like you. And this can be split into scholarships, where even some are there for you to go and further your trade or your art fellowships, some are visiting fellowships where you can go visit, some are where you invite a, sen a fellow to come and uh, 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 come to your center or your organization, internships and competitions and contests. Now, I want to illustrate some of these 
Uh, so the website is called Opportunities for Africans. These are some of the latest opportunities that are there. Um, some of these are for journalists who work in certain industries and trades. Here is a, a, a residency where you can go as part of a cultural residency to a, a, a country. In this case, it's through the Rockefeller Foundation. Um, you also have uh, opportunities such as the um, scholarships for studying. Uh, some of these uh, scholarships are also for short-term courses that you may want to do. Uh, there are also fellowships related to issues such as um, the British Council for Arts Professionals and Organizations. Um, to support efforts that people might be having on the ground. So I always think the best search for a funding opportunity lies in also broadening your search criteria. Don't just rely on that same uh, local municipality funding call that comes out once at the end of the year, and then uh, you are not even told who got the funding until the following year, it advertises again. I always say, even in searching for funding for my research projects, that every week should be a week which is dedicated to looking, just looking for opportunities, uh, like the Valentino, like the, the KFC model, uh, going there, throwing yourself out in terms of uh, uh, subscribing to email lists, subscribing to um, Notified uh, on Instagram, Facebook, uh, of who the funders are and what they're constantly looking out for. I will send also resources of some of the most commonly sought after uh, funders uh, or opportunities that exist in the creative sector. But I will be very honest, I'm going to take a broader approach. I'm not going to talk to your National Arts Council and the ones that you know about, DESRAC and all of that. I'm going to try and look at it from a regional and an international uh, perspective. And then we can also uh, send that as a separate document uh, to you. Colleagues, thank you for your time this morning. Uh, for I think we are 16 minutes over, but I really enjoyed the discussions. And I'm so happy also that our colleagues from SACO are here listening all to these discussions because these are crucial also to help us. I think we can have one round of questions and comments and then we can give over for closure. Uh, YP National Chairperson. Uh, yeah, uh, thanks Prof Papama uh, speaking. Uh, sorry, I joined a bit late, but I wanted to say uh, there was that article that was published some years back encouraging clusters and collaboration. Uh, and I think it came through SACO as well back then. So I still think that is still the modus that's going to assist a lot of the efforts that we are making in the sector. And also, I think it's important to foreground case studies that are showing new pathways uh, of work. Uh, for instance, you know, I, I'm in the architectural space, but the architectural space tends to see itself as belonging to the infrastructure sector more than the creative sector. So once you shift the lens and start to see it from that perspective, there are interesting opportunities in areas like film and, and other things that start to, to open up. So I think once we, 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 we start to foreground these unconventional pathways and case studies of people who are moving across disciplinary boundaries, uh, we might be able to, to demonstrate what this future of work could look like. And also, I just think that the policy landscape is probably as arguably favorable as it might get, uh, because I think we are a country that is constrained by a lot of things. So I don't always expect that government is going to write the policies and then do the actual work for us. We have to find a way as a creators to be early adopters of some of the opportunities that the policy landscape uh, enables. Thanks, otherwise. Thank you. Very good. Um, I like the idea of being innovators as well. I think that's important, uh, not just be uh, reactors to the issues, but to also set the agenda as well. Great point. Okay. 
Thank you, colleagues. I see no other hands. I will give over to our hosts uh, as we close. And thank you very much. All the material will be made available through the hosts who will then uh, send it via email to you. Thank you. Um, um, sorry about that, Titus. Your mic is muted. Oh, sorry, and I saw. Um, can you hold on a sec? I saw a hand no. up from Kanya. Um, sorry, Puff, to take over. Kanya. Okay. Well. All right. Okay. You may proceed, um, Titus. Thank you. Uh, again, uh, once more, thanks, Prof for a very insightful session. Uh, based on the comments and the engagements, uh, if that is not an indication of how uh, 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 successful and uh, insightful was this session, then I don't know what it is. Uh, thanks everybody for taking time, more so on a Friday to join us and stay until the end. Uh, because of the nature of the importance of Prof's uh, uh, topic and presentation, we'll be hosting another one for those who couldn't uh, join on the, on the 19th. Uh, which, which will be on a Tuesday. So please just share with other people that you feel will benefit from this session. Uh, the more, uh, the merrier. And once more again, thanks, Prof. And thanks, everybody. Uh, bye.